Okay, so welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing uh, the uh, leukocyte extravasation. Okay, so uh, we were just discussing type 1 activation of endothelial cells, which is going to occur when ligands such as histamine uh, interact with the uh, endothelial cells by binding to receptors on the surface of the endothelial cells, which are coupled to GQ, um, G proteins. Okay, so, uh, one of the things which happens is that you get vasodilatation of the terminal arterioles. The endothelial cells start producing uh, prostacyclin and nitric oxide, which relax the smooth muscle cells around the terminal arterioles, and this results in vasodilatation and an increased blood flow to the uh, affected area. Okay, so the next thing that happens uh, when endothelial cells undergo type 1 activation is that you open up gaps between neighboring endothelial cells. So let me draw this. So if this is a, whoops, if this is an endothelial cell here with its nucleus, okay, and then we'll draw its neighbor here, okay, then basically in normal capillaries, which are in uh, healthy tissues basically, uh, these two endothelial cells will not have a large space in between them. Instead, there are special protein complexes uh, which are going to adhere the two endothelial cells nice and close together. So let me show this. So let's draw this in a bigger picture now. Okay, so let's say these are the two boundaries of uh, these two endothelial cells here. And basically, you have two major protein junctions. Okay, so endothelial cell 1 here, let's label this endothelial cell 1 and this endothelial cell 2. Endothelial cell 1 will provide a huge number of proteins here, which will form a complex with the equivalent proteins from endothelial cell 2. Okay, and this is what's known as a tight junction between the two endothelial cells. Okay, and its effect is that it holds the two neighboring endothelial cells very tightly together. It also forms an actual physical occlusion to anything moving uh, between the two endothelial cells in this gap. Because if you think about a molecule in the bloodstream trying to get out, then it would have to get past the proteins involved in this tight junction, basically. And they form a physical occlusion blocking its flow out. Okay, in addition, you have another important junction underneath the tight junction, so more basally than uh, the tight junctions, which is known as the adherens junction. Okay, so again, endothelial cell 1 will provide proteins in, and endothelial cell 2 will have proteins in its membrane, which also attach, uh, well, uh, which also contribute to this complex here. Okay, and the two um, protein complexes will then uh, join together to make the adherens junction between the two cells. Okay, now, uh, as I say, these tight junctions and these adherens junctions, which you have between endothelial cells absolutely everywhere, uh, these firstly are keeping the two membranes very tightly opposed to one another, and also they provide that physical occlusion to things moving out of the blood vessels. So this usually keeps uh, endothelial uh, very tight, basically, so that things cannot leak out of the uh, blood vessels. Okay, now when the endothelial cells undergo type 1 activation, then basically we're going to open up uh, gaps between the endothelial cells so that things within the blood can start to leak out of the blood vessels and into the interstitial fluid. Because remember, we want to try and move troops from the bloodstream into the interstitial fluid. Okay, so in the capillaries and the postcapillary venules, you're going to open up gaps between the endothelial cells. Now, this is done by a process known as endothelial contraction, which is activated by type 1 activation, so endothelial contraction. So what happens in endothelial contraction is that uh, you're going to pull these tight junctions and adherens junctions apart. Now the way this happens is that the cytoplasmic domains of both the proteins involved in the tight junctions and uh, the proteins involved in the adherens junctions are attached to actin filaments, which are uh, within the cytoplasm of the cell. 
Okay, so actin filaments are huge, great strands which are constructed out of actin proteins. So, what I'm drawing here, each one of these little circles represents an actin protein. So, this is a single actin protein in, ooh, it's gone horrible colour, in supposedly light green. That is a uh, single actin protein. However, you can join many actin proteins together, like I've done here, to make an actin polymer, which is what's known as an actin filament. Okay, so you can make huge, great strands, and even though I've stopped drawing it after uh, six of them, uh, this will go on and on and on, and you'll create a huge, great actin filament, so it'll go on this way, basically. Okay, uh, and you have these actin filaments attached to the cytoplasmic domains of the proteins involved in these uh, tight junctions and also these adherens junctions. Now, basically, when uh, the endothelial cells in the capillaries and the post-capillary venules undergo type 1 activation, these actin filaments are going to contract. Now, if this actin filament contracts, it's going to pull the cytoplasmic domain of this tight junction here. Uh, that's, well, the proteins that are on endothelial cell 1, they're going to get pulled in this direction. Okay. Um, in addition, the cytoplasmic domains of these proteins on endothelial cell 1 involved in this adherens junction, they're also going to get pulled in that direction. They're going to get pulled towards the centre of the cell. Now, the same is true for endothelial cell 2. When these actin filaments here contract, they're going to pull towards the centre of the cell, and they're going to pull the proteins involved in this tight junction in that direction, and the proteins involved in the adherens junction in that direction. And as you can see, we're going to end up pulling uh, the proteins involved in the tight and adherens junction for endothelial cell 1 in the opposite direction to the proteins involved in the tight and adherens junctions for endothelial cell 2. So you're going to end up pulling the tight junctions and the adherens junctions apart. Okay. Now that will open up a gap between these two endothelial cells, and now fluid from the blood can leave the bloodstream and go into the interstitial space through this gap between the two endothelial cells. Okay, uh, now this gap is big enough for proteins to move through, but it's not big enough for cells to move through. So cells aren't going to start moving through here, but you are going to get uh, fluid and proteins coming in. And this mixture of fluid and proteins, this is known as an inflammatory exudate. Okay, and it's going to cause swelling at the area of inflammation. And uh, the old Latin name for swelling is to call it uh, tumor, exudate. Okay, so there's another Latin word to describe another of the pillars of inflammation, which is tumor. And this occurs because of the bringing in of the inflammatory exudate. Okay, so so far we've seen rubor, calor, tumor. Okay, those are three of the five pillars of uh, inflammation. Okay, right. Uh, we'll see the other two in a moment. So, what's the point of this inflammatory exudate? Okay, well, the point is that it brings in a huge number of proteins from the blood, which are going to be useful in um, both attacking the pathogen that has uh, so foolishly invaded our cells, and also in containing the pathogenic infection, and also in leading to a positive feedback loop. So, let me give you the examples of this. So, uh, some of the proteins that are going to come in are, you have complement proteins in the blood which are circulating inactive, but uh, when they meet a pathogen, they will activate complement cascades, and uh, complement cascades result in pathogens getting coated in C3B. Okay, so you coat pathogens in C3B. So let me draw a picture of this. So here is our pathogen here. Okay, let me get my red pen to circle it. Okay, and you're now going to cover this pathogen in C3B. Okay, so this is what the complement cascades result in. One of the things the complement cascades result in. They result in pathogens being utterly covered uh, by C3B. Now, C3B is a powerful opsonin. 
And I'll explain what that means in a moment. So let me just colour in C3B in blue here. Okay. So an opsonin means that it's going to promote the phagocytosis of this microbe. Now we haven't talked about phagocytosis yet because we haven't completed our discussion of uh, the type 1 activation yet. But in a moment what we're going to talk about is uh, how we're going to start recruiting phagocytes into the site of uh, inflammation. And this is the main topic for this video, how to re recruit both neutrophils and monocytes, which are both phagocytes. Now, let me explain what a phagocyte is, because this will help us in a moment. And it will also help us what C3B is going to be helpful in doing. So we will recruit these phagocytes in a moment. We'll see where they come from very soon. Okay, but there are for now, uh, there are going to be cells moved out from the bloodstream into the interstitial fluid, and these are what are known as phagocytes collectively. Okay, now the two major examples of phagocytes that we're going to see are neutrophils. These are kind of like your pawns of the immune system. They're quite cheap, um, very, pr uh, you've got a lot of them. Uh, and they're not a particularly powerful cell, but as I say, you've got a lot of them, so you just throw them at the infection. Okay, and they've got a slightly more powerful, more expensive cell uh, known as a macrophage. Okay, now what do these cells do? Well, basically, firstly, they have to bind to the pathogen. Now, C3B is going to be an opsonin. Now, what that means is that the phagocytes have receptors for C3B on their surface. Okay, so let me try and draw this. So here is a receptor for C3B on this phagocyte surface, and it will bind to C3B, and that's one of the ways that uh, phagocytes can bind to uh, pathogens, basically, if they're coated in C3B. Okay, and now what it's going to do is it's going to engulf that pathogen. So what will happen is it will invaginate its cell membrane around the pathogen like so. Okay, so you'll get the pathogen here, let's say. It's got its C3B bound to it, which is then bound to the C3B receptor. So in turquoise here, this is supposed to represent the C3B receptor. Okay, on the surface of the phagocyte, and I'm going to have to give this phagocyte a nucleus. It just looks too disturbing without one. Okay, but as we'll see, uh, this now suggests that this is a monocyte, sorry, a macrophage, rather than a uh, neutrophil, because neutrophils have very odd-shaped nuclei. Okay, so, um, this is our microbe here in red. Okay, we then have the C3B receptor in turquoise there. Okay, on the surface of the pathogen, and we have our C3B on the surface of, sorry, we have C3B receptors on the surface of the mic, uh, no, we have C3B receptors on the surface of the phagocyte, the uh, monocyte, sorry, the macrophage or neutrophil, and you have C3B on the surface of the pathogen, and we can see that the membrane is invaginating uh, in. What will then happen is this membrane will pinch off down here, and you'll then get basically a vesicle within the phagosome, like so, with the microbe contained within it. Okay, and this vesicle with the microbe contained in it is what's known as a phagosome. So let me bring this up a little bit. Okay, so this specialized vesicle which contains the microbe or the pathogen is what's known as a phagosome. Okay, now uh, the uh, phagocyte will also have other vesicles within its cytoplasm, known as lysosomes, okay, so let's draw these here. So these are lysosomes here, okay, and these lysosomes are full of enzymes known as lysozymes, okay, so let me put that down, lysozymes, uh, which will break down the pathogen if they're exposed to it. So what's now going to happen is these lysosomes are going to fuse with the phagosome membrane, releasing their lysozymes into the uh, phagosome, and then the lysozymes will digest the pathogen, basically. Okay, so this is a way of clearing the pathogen, uh, and we're going to talk about how we recruit these uh, phagocytes in a moment. That's the main topic for this video. Uh, but that's what C3B does. It's going to um, opsonize, as it's called. It's called an opsonin, 
and it means basically that it increases the chance of the pathogen being phagocytosed if the pathogen is covered in C3B and that process of increasing the chance of the pathogen being phagocytosed is what's known as opsonization. Okay, so we'll continue this discussion in the next video.